what on an instantaneous basis is sort of necessary to keep you alive? What, what are those things? Well, the first one is oxygen. The second one is water. And the third one is food. Now, if you look at oxygen, how much do you pay for oxygen? You don't, you just breathe it in. What about water? What is water worth? What does it cost? Well, if, in your, if you're in a municipal area, it probably costs you somewhere on the order of about a tenth of a cent a gallon. And that's water that you can drink right now and not get sick, which is an amazing thing. Food, how much does food cost? Well, from a standpoint of our nation, we spend about 6% of GDP on food, which is really cheap worldwide. There's some, some people who are spending 80% of what they earn on food. But from an economic standpoint, the value of those commodities, oxygen, water, food, is very low. And a lot of people don't understand how much water goes into making food. In general gross numbers of of developed water in California, that means water that's either coming out of a dam or going down a ditch or a canal. Uh, of the developed water, about 20% goes to urban uses and 80% to ag. There's a reason for that. It takes a lot of water to grow food. We're willing to pay a whole bunch for a, a new big TV, but yet you get upset when you have to pay more for a gallon of water or more for food. Oxygen, water, and food are the three most important things to keep you alive. Yet, what's the, what's the value of them? Well, intrinsically, the value is really high. If you don't have it, you die. Production funding for this program has been provided by the Myers Farms Family Trust, bringing awareness to the consumer of the responsible agricultural practices performed by farmers in the fertile fields of the San Joaquin Valley, preserving the world's food supply and natural habitats for the generations yet to come. We are proud to support quality educational programs like Tapped Out and Valley's Gold, only available on Valley PBS. The Fresno Scraper was the first practical earth moving equipment and it was developed actually to build a canal in Fresno County. That canal was finally named the Fowler Switch Canal and irrigated an area between what's now the towns of Fowler and Selma. And the builders of that canal were Frank Ducey and Abijah McCall. They were the ones who developed a scraper. About the same time, James Porteous of Fresno was developing a scraper as well. Porteous is credited by the Fresno historians with developing the Fresno scraper. But I'm a Selma guy, and I've always thought it was McCall and Ducey who invented it, especially since Porteous bought their patent. Since the days of California's gold rush in the mid-19th century, the landscape of the San Joaquin Valley has been changing. As human beings have done for a long time, finding water and then harnessing its flow to grow food shaped Central California as we know it today. population in the state grew, the need to build infrastructure to supply fresh water to millions moving west would also have a dramatic impact on the land. In the early days of San Joaquin Valley farming, before the Central Valley project was constructed, disputes over water and how to get it were already lively issues. 
The disputes over water rights were really something at times. On the Kings River, where there was no water master in those days, there was no overseeing authority to what was going on, no agreements at all. It was easy to file a claim for water. You just had to go out and post a notice to see how much water you were going to take and then go out and prove up on it, build your canal, and uh, away you go. Theoretically, you had a better right than the next guy. Well, it turned out that there were claims on the Kings River of more than 200,000 cubic feet per second of flow. And almost never does the Kings River get above 20,000. And so you can imagine what happened. There were lawsuits, there were disputes, there were injunctions. And there were times when water was coaxed through the head gates at the business end of shotguns. But long before settlers discovered the bounty of the West, people were here, living with the rhythm of early California's water and environment. In the times before the gold rush in California, when the grasslands of the Central Valley were home to the Yokuts tribe of Native Americans, water was as important then as it is now and will always be for human beings. The Yokuts occupied much of the Central Valley and built their villages on raised mounds of earth to protect them from spring floods that came with snowmelt. The Great Tulare Lake was a vital part of life for the Yokuts subtribes like the Tachi. Life for the Central Valley Yokuts was fairly quiet through the late 17 and early 1800s, with Spanish and Mexican influence keeping mostly to California's coast. But by 1850, as the discovery of gold brought waves of settlers from the east, the days of the Yokuts came to end. By the 1920s and advancements in the turbine pump making groundwater more accessible to farmers, widespread ground pumping for irrigation literally changed the landscape in the valley again. As below ground aquifers were drained faster than they could be replenished, the San Joaquin Valley floor began to sink, an effect called subsidence. This situation and the complete drying up of groundwater in the east and south ends of the valley led to the creation of the Central Valley Project. Frank Dam was built in the early 1940s along the San Joaquin River sending water south as far as Bakersfield via the Friant Kern Canal and north to the fields of Madera County using the Madera Canal. At the same time, Shasta Dam was constructed as part of the CVP to deliver water to senior water rights holders who had agreed to exchange their riparian rights on the San Joaquin for the Shasta water via the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta system. Once water hit the Delta from Shasta, it would be pumped into the Delta Mendota Canal and back into the San Joaquin River to make up for the reduced natural flows Fryant Dam was now diverting. The Central Valley Project was a well-planned and built system designed to do several things at the same time. The dams provided flood protection to the growing population centers in the valley while delivering surface water to thirsty growers along the east side of the San Joaquin Valley and its drier southern reaches. And it directly impacted groundwater overdrafting concerns by giving farmers enough water to properly irrigate their fields. 
providing water to grow crops using flood irrigation that also directly recharged groundwater storage. But as the success of the Central Valley Project brought economic growth and prosperity to the San Joaquin Valley, a new stress point was beginning to grow at a rapid rate. By the early 1950s, the population of California had reached 10 and a half million people, with most of those settling in Southern California, and Sacramento began to see the problem coming. Most of the state's population was growing in a place that didn't have enough water to support it. The State Water Project differs from the uh, western portions of the Central Valley Project in that the water source is the Feather River. And of course, Lake Orville was formed. It's a huge lake and uh, it's up above the town of Oroville and water is released down the Feather River, joins the Sacramento River and finds its way into the Delta to a large pumping plant that the state project maintains about a mile away from the Central Valley Project's pumping plant northwest of Tracy. And there, uh, just as the Central Valley Project uh, pumping plant puts water into the Delta Mendota Canal, the much larger state water project plant pumps water uphill and puts it into the California aqueduct and then starts sending it south on its long journey to the southern San Joaquin Valley in Southern California. California was in need of a statewide water management system. With the Central Valley Project being primarily an irrigation-based system for agriculture, the state got to work on organizing its water planning efforts for a rapidly growing population. The California Department of Water Resources was created in 1956, and one year later, the California Water Plan was written. In 1960, a proposal to pay for the state plan, the Burns-Porter Act, passed by a narrow margin and provided the initial funding amount of $1.75 billion for construction of Stage 1 of the State Water Project. The SWP would be one of the largest public water and power utilities in the world and a behemoth construction effort involving much of the state. Here is how California's State Water Plan was laid out. The primary water source for the project is Lake Oroville in Northern California. The massive Oroville Dam was built on the Feather River, creating Lake Oroville with a capacity of 3.5 million acre feet of water. Water from the lake is released and flows into the Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta. In the southern end of the Delta, the state pumping facility, very similar to the CVP pumping facility only a mile away, pumps the Delta water up to the beginning of the California aqueduct. Here, the aqueduct and the Delta Mendota Canal parallel each other, and both are eventually pumped up and into the San Luis Reservoir. This massive two million acre foot lake is an incredibly important part of California's entire water infrastructure. It's where water is banked to be used in both the State Water Project and for the Central Valley Project's west side water delivery obligations. When needed, water is dropped back into the aqueduct where it travels south along the valley's west side on its way to the Tehachapi Mountains near the Grapevine. Along the way, various agricultural users have contracts to pull water out of the State Water Project, but of all the water the SWP conveys, only about 30% is used for Central Valley Ag. The other 70% goes to urban and industrial use in Southern California and the Southern San Francisco Bay Area. Once the state water hits the grapevine, the Edmonston pumping plant lifts the water 1,926 feet, the largest single water lift in the world, on its way over the Tehachapi Mountains and down into Southern California. So the State Water Project, you know, this was really uh, about, in a lot of people's minds, kind of completing this big backbone of infrastructure for, for storing and, and moving water from places where there was a lot of water, in the, especially in the Sierra and especially in the northern part of the state, to places that had a lot of farmland and that had a lot of people and there were, there wasn't as much local water supply. So 
that's where some deal making was done to kind of get enough folks on board to back the project. It's an interesting project because sometimes people think about state water project as something that was paid for by taxpayers, and that's not actually true. Uh, what the state water project did was get voter approval, general voter approval for general obligation bonds that the state would issue, but the state signed deals with all of the irrigation districts and water districts that were going to get that water, and they're the ones who are actually paying it back. So what it means is that municipal residents, ratepayers, as well as farmers in the irrigation districts are paying back the cost of the state water project. President John F. Kennedy visited San Luis Reservoir's groundbreaking ceremony on August 18, 1962 to celebrate this much-needed state water project and the construction of the nation's first federal and state joint reservoir. This is a fast trip, but if uh, it had no other benefit than to permit us to look at this valley and others like it across the country, where we can see the greenest and most richest earth producing the greatest and richest crops in the country. And then a mile away, see the same earth and see it brown and dusty and useless and all because there's water in one place and there isn't in another. I know of no better trip for any president or any member of the House or Senate or indeed any citizen, particularly those of us who live in the East where water is everywhere and is a burden to realize how very precious it is here in the Western United States. And I'm also glad to come from Washington, where we are constantly struggling and seeing a progress being made almost imperceptibly, to come and visit three areas, South Dakota, Colorado, and here, where progress is being made. And the important lesson in all of those projects is that progress isn't being made as a result of a sudden idea suddenly coming into fruition. This project, the frying pan Arkansas and the project in South Dakota represented 10, 20 and 30 years effort of devoted citizens. If things do not happen, they are made to happen. And this project is the result and our action today of 30 years of men, some of whom have now died, who thought that this dam would help this valley. President Kennedy was there for the groundbreaking of the uh, San Luis Dam and he made it clear that this was a great project that was absolutely needed by California and San Luis Reservoir is vital, absolutely vital to water users all the way down to the Mexican border. The, the pumps in the, in the south end of the Delta really fuel this entire state and keep it alive from the Delta South. Whether it's ag, whether it's people, it's M&I users, you know, municipal industrial, the water that comes out your tap, all that matters. And there are other areas where water comes from, but without that source there, this would be a completely different state. With both of California's major water projects up and running, a storm began to brew. A movement to protect the environment from the kinds of resource expansion the CVP and state projects provided. In 1970, the Endangered Species Act was passed and with it, the environmental movement became a serious player in California water. So the federal government made a promise, just like your social security, just like a lot of things, the federal government came in and said, we promise you this supply of water. You're gonna have, we guarantee you, if you do this, you will have this, uh, this water supply. Okay, most of us did and went along with that. But here's the problem. Our water is physically in Shasta Lake. 
the water is physically there. It has to be released from Shasta Lake and it gets to the Delta and it has to be picked up there and put and delivered to us. Because of the Endangered Species Act, they release water from Shasta, it floats down the Sacramento River, it gets to the Delta and it could be, well, we have issues today, sorry, but we can't pump them out of water. You know, my father at age 57 essentially uh, took all of his savings and raised as much money as possible to buy some farmland at a time where he probably should have been thinking about retirement. But instead, he bought farmland here, and the reason he bought it he had so much confidence in the strength of a contract with the federal government. He had a contract in place that was to provide a 40-year contract that was to supply about 2.65 acre feet to this property out here. That's a supplemental supply to, to farm with. He also maintained wells and we continued to drill wells and, and, and did that, but he made some significant decisions in his life and from an investment standpoint, all centered and based around this contract that he felt was like gold with the, with the government. What he didn't anticipate, or a lot of people didn't expect, was during the Nixon years when they passed the Endangered Species Act, I don't think anybody ever contemplated, I don't think President Nixon contemplated that that act could be used to curtail water flows and destroy uh, family wealth and communities uh, in these projects that were really built for the public good. So we created a system that allowed for public investment to allow a region like this to, to flourish. And now we're using other laws today to turn the tap off and really bring hardships to families and their investments and the communities that they're in. It's a, it's a tragic story. In the Central Valley, water is an incredibly important resource for both the natural environment and at the same time agriculture. And so one of the challenges that we have is thinking about how do we have both the natural environment that we want to have and also an economically productive agricultural community that is able to, to feed our nation. We've had this long history in California of protecting our rivers and salmon, but we also, until the 1970s, really had no sense of just how powerful humans had become to transform our landscape. You know, in the same way that we always thought that the oceans were always gonna be abundant with fish, we didn't have the sense that we could drive our native species to extinction, that we could actually dam a river and dry it up completely until the construction of the Central Valley Project. And ultimately, it was Section 5937 of the Fish and Game Code that the courts cited when they found that uh, the Bureau of Reclamation had violated the law, had violated state law in its operation of Friant Dam, um, thanks to our lawsuit that uh, took almost 20 years to prosecute and that we've been settling to restore the river um, ever since 2006. The first of many changes Central California agriculture would face due to environmental protections was a long-fought battle brought by the Natural Resources Defense Council against the federal government's Bureau of Reclamation. The courts sided with the NRDC, finding that the original CVP plan violated fish and wildlife protection laws already in place in California. And on October 30th, 1992, the Central Valley Project Improvement Act was signed into law. The new rules for the CVP called for large amounts of water to be taken away from farmers and put back into rivers to enhance conditions for fish and wildlife. In one article of the law, 800,000 acre feet of water was now to be released from Friant and Shasta dams annually, diverted away from the growing fields of the San Joaquin Valley and into the river channels to the Delta and out to sea.
there's a lot of discussion and debate about how much water has been allocated to the environment and what that means for how much water is available to folks in the valley as well as to Southern California and the Bay Area. Um, what we found in doing some, some recent work is that there's never been a very good accounting for that. Um, so people often just see one piece of that puzzle and nobody's looked at all the numbers to kind of add it up. Probably one of the biggest myths that's out there is that farmers use 80% of California's water. It's not true and I'll tell you why. If you look at the water pie in California, you know there's three users. You've got the environment you know, that uses 50% and you've got 10% for cities and 40% for agriculture. Um, but what they do is they take the pie, you know, they take 50% of the pie that's for the environment and they remove it from the equation. And then they use a pie that's 50% smaller and represents 50% of the water. So now you've got, you know, cities using 20% of a 50% pie, which is still 10%, and you have agriculture using, you know, 80% of a pie that's 50%, so it's still 40%. As the battle between valley agriculture and the environment over water continued to escalate into the 21st century, new battlefields were established. One of the most talked about in the fight, the Delta Smelt. The Sacramento-San Joaquin Delta is ground zero for most of the debates and regulations on water use in California. It's a complex and sensitive ecosystem where most of California's rivers dump fresh water into an open estuary that leads to the San Francisco Bay. A constant shoving match happens every day in the Delta with salt water from the Pacific pushing in and fresh water from the Sierra Nevada mountains pushing back. In the middle, species like Delta smelt and Chinook salmon deal with not only this natural back and forth of fresh and salt water, but have also had to adapt to reduce natural fresh water flows from rivers like the San Joaquin due to the construction of the Central Valley Project and State Water Project. For the smelt, a small fish only inches long and with a short lifespan of under two years, when the giant pumps in Tracy are turned on to send water up to the Delta Mendota Canal for the CVP or the California Aqueduct for the State Water Project, the power of these pumps can literally change the natural flow of water in the Delta, drawing the small fish into the pumps and killing them. Filters in the pumps are regularly checked and when a certain number of smelt have been killed, the pumps are shut down. Sometimes for weeks, even when valley farmers are in need of water for their crops, water they sign contracts with the government to get. A lot of times people are, are complaining about protections for Delta smelt as though that were the only thing driving the system. But the reality is that protections for smelt are, are generally pretty limited and by and large they're the same as what's necessary to protect salmon in the Delta and um, over the last couple years in particular there's been almost no protections that have impacted water supply from smelt. Um, there was virtually none in 2014 or 2015. It really was the drought, not environmental protections, that caused low water allocations. And the same is true this year. You know, we're in a year of abundance. We've got water flowing everywhere, and there's been no water supply impact um, due to smelt. And that's not just me saying that. The Westlands Water District has admitted that as well. In a year like 2017, the State Water Project has lost around 600,000 acre feet of pumping capacity just in the last month because of the project being shut down for emergency repairs. And it's not due to any environmental protections. We actually lost, even if the project was not broken, even if the state water project didn't have to shut down for these repairs, we had no place to put water. The San Luis Reservoir filled completely, just as it did in 2011, the last wet year. And so in these wet years, we actually have a system where we don't have the capacity south of the Delta in terms of storage to be able to uh, divert sustainable amounts of water from the Delta. And so that's why NRDC actually promoted additional south of Delta storage, like expanding San Luis Reservoir as part of our portfolio. 
Now there are some interests who actually benefit from the current situation. The Metropolitan Water District of Southern California and the Kern County Water Agency that has the Kern Water Bank, they have the ability to take what's known as Article 21 water. It's surplus water when there's no other way to store the water. And so in a year like this, they're getting Article 21 water um, that is not available to other water users because they've invested in their own storage. One thing that people often forget is that some of the environmental flow requirements or the requirements to leave water in the delta are about keeping the water from being too salty. And that has multiple reasons. We would, even if there were no fish living in the delta, we would need some of the, that water to stay in the delta and go under the Golden Gate Bridge just to keep the water at the pumps fresh enough so that water coming into the San Joaquin Valley would not be too salty. I'm Sharon Weaver, Executive Director of the San Joaquin River Parkway and Conservation Trust. Our mission is to preserve and restore land along the San Joaquin River, and our major area of interest is between Friant Dam and Highway 99. And so the parkway reach of the river is meant to be a series of parks, trails, and open space with a continuous trail system um, for 22 miles along the San Joaquin River. So it's really about both protecting the wildlife habitat values of the river and also providing opportunities for new recreational access along the river. With the high flows that have been in the river this year, we have basically what has happened is it has made some areas of the river inaccessible to us. So some areas where we might normally be doing projects along the river, we just can't get to those areas because they're underwater right now. Um, but that's a normal thing. Um, rivers flood from time to time and it's great to see high flows in the river because that has the benefit of recharging our water table all along the river channel. And that's one of the things that I think people often overlook um, you hear a lot of discussion about the fact that water that is going out to the delta is wasted in some way. Um, that's certainly not how we see it, and I think that's not how a lot of farmers along the river channel see it. Because actually when you have water flowing in the river channel, then the river is able to function the way it was intended to function, which is as a recharge area. Um, the river channel is a sandy and rocky substrate. All of the ground underneath the river is sandy and rocky, which means that it can um, allow water to seep in. And over time, as you have more water in the river channel, that helps recharge our groundwater basin. Because of the lawsuit that the farmers filed, this is not related to NRDC versus Friant, which is something that happened in the 80s, but this is something that happened back in the 50s and 60s when um, the Rank family helped file a lawsuit representing farmers, making sure that farmers would get the water they need um, along the river channel. There is a minimum amount of water that has to reach gravelly ford. And so because of that early um, legal process, the Bureau of Reclamation has to deliver a certain amount of water along the river channel out to a place called gravelly ford. And that's a few miles downstream from us. I think it's about 30 miles from where we're standing right now. So that's why we have water in this section of the San Joaquin River today. It's interesting, our organization actually takes a lot of people out on the river on canoes and kayaks to introduce people to the river. And so many times we take people out and people are just astounded that we have this right in our own backyard. And they say, wow, you know, I feel like I'm in a different place. People hear so much about the river being dewatered that they often believe that the river in our area is dry. And we actually have 
a really nice river channel right here outside of Fresno, right on the boundary of the city of Fresno. And part of the reason for that is that the farmers fought for their water rights so that they would have water in the river channel to use for agriculture. I think another uh, a perspective from a farmer here in the South Valley, I, I can't think of anybody than my uh, ourselves, our friends and neighbors that want to see the health of the Delta improved. After all, if it was improved, we would be getting water returned to us. But after about 25 years of the government and various agencies trying to improve the Delta by changing the flows of water, by reducing the flow of water to regions like this, or, or making greater demands on the San Joaquin or moving further north in the state now, looking at the Tuolumne and other rivers in the region to pull more water out of the system, they've shown little to no success. Um, I think we need to hold these people accountable uh, that are impacting the lives of so many of us, you know, south of the Delta. And we all know that the environment and the Delta, it, uh, it's a complex ecosystem, and yet, we are currently running the system only tweaking one possible factor, and that's the flow of water in and out of the delta, where we have uh, predaceous fish, uh, invasive species, we have effluent being pumped by uh, urban uh, uh, areas uh, around the delta. We have so many factors that are impacting the delta, and yet we're simply turning the knob on one, and that's water flow, and it's having a huge horrible impact to those of us south of the Delta. We've got this new third user that is siphoning off of the system that was originally built for two. It was built to bring water to people and to agriculture so that they could feed the people. And now we've got this unaccountable third straw in there that is siphoning 50% of the water. And I say unaccountable because um, it may be well-intentioned um, environmental in interventions, but the, there are, there's no proof that what they're doing is working. Personally, would like to see some common sense put into what we have already. We, we have pumps in the Delta already. We've had the Endangered Species Act since 1970. Well, I mean, something allowed us to farm since, you know, the Endangered Species Act should be changed because under the wrong people, it can get a little crazy. We've seen that the last eight years. So with the line now drawn in the sand between agriculture and environmentalism in the state, who is doing a better job of pleading their side of things to the people? The environmentalist view has had the benefit of a governor and state legislature that leans towards their way of addressing the water crisis in California and new laws and regulations that continue to hurt agriculture keep coming. So why hasn't agriculture done a better job of getting its side of the story out? A lot of people ask me, well, why hasn't ag done a better job of like stepping up and telling their story and what have you? And I think it's a couple reasons. Uh, one, the typical farmer is a farmer because he doesn't, uh, he likes, he's very independent, he's an entrepreneur, they want to do their own thing, and so it's not like you want to get together and fight the battle with everybody else necessarily. I think it's just kind of built in all of our DNA to go out and manage our properties and do them well individually. So there's an element of that. But the other element is that as it relates to water, and I mentioned this before, there are all different uh, rights holders. And so everybody has different levels of skin in this game. So if you're a junior rights holder, like we are, you feel a lot of pressure and you feel like there's gotta be a lot more done as a ag industry to address this. If you're a senior rights holder, I think you sympathize with the guy that's, that's losing his water down there, but uh, you're probably less inclined to wanna to wage and enter the battle until you start feeling some of the heat yourself. started my job depends on ag in 2015 and um, 
when I got my Facebook page, I'm, I'm out here working and, you know, I got a small business in agriculture, small farmer too, and, and uh, I didn't have a lot of, I wasn't exposed to a lot, to the reality of how big the disconnect is between the farm and, and our urban friends, our consumers, the people who eat our products. They are learning information about what I do from someone else who doesn't do what I do. And so getting on Facebook, it exposed me to seeing articles written in the comments from our consumers about what we're doing and I was aghast about how big the divide was. I started the California Water for Food and People movement as a way to bypass the mainstream media because I felt like um, you know California wasn't really being told the whole story about California's water and some of the information that you would hear um, was not accurate, yet it was repeated over and over. And so I just thought that we needed to raise awareness and get the rest of the story out there and correct the misinformation. When it comes to water, I think in California, it, it's a, it, there's a perception, this is where the distrust comes from, that our culture is consuming more and more and more and more of, of that finite resource we have than they have before. It's like, but that's not true. In the last five years here where we've been dealing with a drought, in most of the last five years, there's not an irrigation district throughout Central California that was able to provide the farmer 100% allocation to farm with. The water just wasn't there. Trip irrigation has been implemented in a huge part of Central California ag, and I have to give kudos to farmers who have been uh, pioneers in water irrigation in order to survive and are at the point now where their water consumption has been cut almost in third. They're growing 30 percent more food with 30 percent less water. I don't know what I'm gonna make next year. I don't know what I'm gonna make next week. But I, as I go along, I have to buckle, you know, tighten up my belt buckle and find out ways to be more efficient, find solutions to my problems to be successful. I want my, I want the state government to play, live by those same rules. I mean, it's just, it's just, to me, if they're not getting the results from what they said was a problem, then we need to go back to the drawing board and find the solution. Look, Delta smelt having making a rebound and salmon making a rebound, it benefits agriculture because if it, if it's if it, if they do good, then we can get water. You see what I'm saying? If I I don't understand why there has to be you have to be pro environment or ag. You know, I just I just don't buy that argument. You know, living in the valley, my life is surrounded by the need for water. And it's not just the farmers, it's not just the towns without water and the people having to wait for the trucks to come in to ship them water, but again, for me, being Homeland Security Chairman, it, it is my life because people don't understand the reality of the impact of, of having produce here. I know that, yes, I have friends and family that are in ag, but ultimately, I am about national security. There's been intel that there will be simultaneous attacks on the United States, many of them power grids, I mean, there's malware right now sitting in U.S. power grids that they cannot get rid of. So it's a matter of when they push their buttons, which to me and to other federal agents, they will tell you that they're just waiting for the right time. Madera County is the fastest growing ag economy in, in the world. It's number nine in the entire world of, of dollar volume ag products. 10 out of 10 of the largest agriculture producing counties in the world are right here in the Central Valley and in California. We grow the food the world eats. I would ask 
about the national security issue at risk here. Do we want other people, other nations, growing our food? Because that's the real question. Some people say, yeah, we, it, it could be grown cheaper elsewhere. But the fact is, haven't we learned our lesson with oil? Do we want somebody saying, look, I got a problem with you. Now another attack that is listed, a potential attack within that simultaneous attack is on the port, which really, it frightens me as well because for those people that are alive and trying to survive, this brings us back to the production of agriculture here. Once the United States is weakened by a terrorist attack on so many different areas and we're shut down what could be temporarily a year to two years, then the bigger nations are going to come in and make their attack because they're going to do the power grab. And that is going to be Iran, China, and Russia. What are we going to do for food? It's going to be mayhem. It's going to be U.S. citizen against U.S. citizen. People will hoard over to the areas that there is produce to try to eat, to try to get food, to try to steal food. Farmers are gonna to try to defend their own food. It is going to be outrageous. And I know this sounds outrageous, but it can really happen. And if you don't think it can happen, think back to 9-11 and the state of disbelief that you were in when you watched on television planes go directly into the Twin Towers. Our nation's security is at risk if we allow another nation to grow our basic needs and necessities. Besides that, it can't be done like it's done here. We have the richest soil, the best producers, the best laborers in the world. Our farmers know how to do this better than anybody else. And we're taking away what they need to do it. We've got to give it back to them because it is a national security issue. 50% of the nation's fruits, nuts, and vegetables come from right here. I was in Washington, D.C. a couple of weeks ago. I sat in a restaurant and I asked the waitress, where do your strawberries come from? She said, well, California, of course. I said, where does this lettuce come from? California. Tomatoes? California. There is not a vegetable on the plate that doesn't come from California. And I would dare say that the rest of the cities in California and the rest of the cities around the world, you take away their salad, they'll begin to notice. We're drilling and they are pushing a casing ahead and along with the drill bit. And that gives you a, uh, a casing that sits next to the, the sediment, the formations. Um, so you have a closed hole above and then you're pulling water out from the bottom. What they're doing here is they're landing it at around 276 and then from there they're going to wind up drilling deeper, probably another 20 feet to have an open hole. This is similar to the, uh, to the old way they drilled wells, which was called a cable tool well, which gives you uh, a casing that fits real close to the formations, and then you pump the water out the bottom. I've got water table change maps for 63 years. It's from um, 1950, to 2013 and there's two areas that have experienced large declines in the water table one of them is beneath metropolitan fresno clovis it's gone down 160 feet in that 63 year period the other area is to the west of us it's the raisin city area um, and 
it goes north towards the San Joaquin, sort of a, a narrow slot that goes up there. And that area has declined, and it's a much larger area where the decline is. Um, it has declined 180 feet in 63 years. The thing that's common to both of those, Metro Fresno Clovis and that Raisin City area, is that neither of them historically had access to surface water. The cities of Fresno and Clovis historically were on groundwater only. At the same time, the surrounding area that's agriculture that has access to surface water has only gone down 20 to 40 feet in that same 63 year period. And what that shows is even though ag uses a huge amount of water, if we have surface water and we've got incidental recharge and we're using that, the water table doesn't suffer as much. So the, the two places where the water table has dropped the greatest, both did not have access to surface water. They were groundwater only. With agriculture in Central California feeling the squeeze between environmental regulations and the last five years of extreme drought, surface water deliveries to many valley farms have been virtually non-existent. But Sacramento figured out how to get the last bit of sacred ground below the farmer's feet. That up until now had been off limits to politicians and environmentalists. In 2014, the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act was passed by state legislators and with it, a dramatic new level of control over the water below privately owned ground was reached. Basically, the new law will require all agricultural groundwater users, no matter their size, to prove they are putting as much water back in the ground as they are pumping out for irrigation. To prepare for the rollout of the enforcement of the new law, also known as SIGMA, local water districts and growers are required to form groundwater sustainability agencies to figure out exactly how they're going to do what the new law will demand in as soon as 2020. We have until 2020 to come up with these plans and the backstop of this whole thing and I think the State Water Resources Control Board are sitting around and kind of licking their chops is that if we are not able to come up with these plans then the Enforcement Act by the State Water Resources Control Board will come into to your living room as a farmer and they will dictate exactly how much water you can use, what crops you can grow and uh, and can completely control your operation. I, for one, as a farmer, I do not want to see that happen, and it can happen. There are many crops, many, that grow in the Central Valley that do not grow anywhere else in the United States. We supply 100% of those crops to this country and beyond. And at the end of the day, every American needs to know and decide um, through their votes, through their wallet, how important it is as a matter of national security for this country, how important it is to have a homegrown food source. It's, it's amazing we can have on the weekend the news station say, um, the new Tom Cruise movie just grows $50 million of three day broke records. Records, it's celebrating the profit of the, of the, of the, of the, of the entertainment industry, it's celebrated. But it's, it's vilified if agriculture or industries like ours have a good year. It's kind of weird to me. You know, in the big scope of things, you're not talking about a big area producing that much food for a country. And the reason is the soil and the climate. And until lately, it, it, our infrastructure, we were allowed to use it. And we've been able to feed this country. And the crops that are going to disappear first... They're not some exotic foods that a minority eats. It's fruits and vegetables and nuts. It's a very important part of the American diet. From the standpoint of the people of the Society of California, your water comes from the tap, your food comes from the grocery store. 
as long as you turn the tap on and water comes out, what me worry? As long as you can go to the grocery store and get food, don't worry. It's only when you turn the tap on and you get air, then you've got a problem. Or you go to the grocery store and there's nothing there, then you have a problem. Otherwise, you don't think about it. Los Angeles, you get your water from the same pumps we do in the same locations. If they're not running, you're gonna have to pay a fine if your city doesn't reduce its water consumption by 25%. And the water was physically there, people. It was physically there. It could be put in and parked and saved for you and for me, but it's not. Production funding for this program has been provided by the Myers Farms Family Trust, bringing awareness to the consumer of the responsible agricultural practices performed by farmers in the fertile fields of the San Joaquin Valley, preserving the world's food supply and natural habitats for the generations yet to come. We are proud to support quality educational programs like Tapped Out and Valley's Gold, only available on Valley.